Welcome to Mime Radio. I'm Karen Hoyer. And I'm James Donlan. Here it is, another episode of Mime Radio Show. Today, we have a very special guest, someone I've known for a while. In fact, he doesn't know it, but I uh, witnessed him walking through a cafeteria in 1974 in Wisconsin, probably a little bit after he'd come to the States. He's British. His name, well, I should say he's lived in the United States now for a long time, you know, 50 years, I'm sure, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. A lot of you know who he is, very special guy. His name is Jeff Hoyle. And let me read a little bit uh, about him to you, especially for you young guys, that uh, people that don't really know who this man is and how he's influenced the world of clowning and circus and physical acting. His name is Jeff Hoyle. He clowned as Mr. Sniff. That was his signature, signature character back in the day. Mr. Sniff in San Francisco's, the original San Francisco's Pickle Family Circus. Um, he was a partner of Bill Irwin back in those days. Cirque du Soleil and Circus Flora. He's appeared at uh, many times at the American Conservatory Theater. He's an equity actor besides uh, fooling around with his body on stage. He's <laughs> performed at Berkeley Rep uh, and off Broadway. Uh, he performing uh, his solos throughout the USA uh, in regional theaters and at European festivals. Jeff performed in the Teatro Zinzani in Seattle and San Francisco. On Broadway, he originated the character of Zazu in The Lion King. He has performed his solos Geezer and Lear's Shadow at venues around the country. Jeff didn't get hit by a bus in his 30s, didn't have a heart attack in his 50s, didn't get frontotemporal dementia or COVID so far in his 70s. <laughs> and now he's old enough to be the grandfather. In his latest piece of foolery, What Will I Be When I Grow Up? Jeff ponders his legacy and vast worldly wisdom and how you pass on the best bits. So without further ado, with great honor, we welcome the one and only Jeff Hoyle to the Mime Radio Show. Hello, Jeff. And there he is. <laughs> Where are you now, Jeff? You're in, uh, where are you? Where are you sitting at this point? I'm sitting in a small cottage that we own in Inverness, California. Yeah, yeah it's a beautiful place. I've been there. Karen's in Chicago. I'm in Oregon and uh, a few There's a fourth miles from person Jeff. on the line too. That's right. I forgot to introduce him. Michael Diaz, our glue man. Sorry, Mike. Uh, He's the man with the fingers and the buttons and the ear, and he will be overseeing this total production as well as providing some surprises later on in the show. Thank you, Michael. So, and so. Jeff, it's so great that you could join us. And uh, we're, we're really interested in hearing about all your experience as a performer, all the places you've been and the things that you've done. But I wanna start with one question. Uh, as you are ready to go on stage, you're ready to start a show or do a lecture or teaching or whatever. When you go on stage, what do you have in your mind? What do you say to yourself before you step out on stage? Well, it depends what I'm going to do. Um, if it's just a, um, a mimetic thing, um, you know, I try and just uh, be centered in some kind of physical way and get my my center of gravity a little bit low feel grounded feel my feet on the ground if uh, if it's a, uh, a show where i actually have lines then i uh, then i say to myself don't worry all you have to do is remember the first line <laughs> I was just going to say a famous quote from Spencer Tracy, who said, just remember your lines and don't bump into the furniture. You're right. That yeah, one's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well known. Yeah, sure. What, uh, what, what is that audience to you? Like, you know, do you have any thoughts about, do you peek at them? Do, I mean, what, what kind of entity or force do you reflect on about who those people are? 
Um, you know, I guess I don't usually peek at them. No. I, I, I hear them and I, it usually makes me somewhat nervous because I know they're there, they're expecting something and they're expecting me to come through for them. And I get quite wound up and it's a bit like as a teacher, you know, you, you, you're preparing for the first day of school and you have no idea what to expect. What will the students be like, be they children, be they adults? And what kind of pressure do they put on you and therefore you put on yourself is kind of off the charts sometimes with me and the same with an audience. But as soon as I get out there and I can see faces or see dim faces or get that first reaction, be it a laugh or you just the feeling that they're getting what I'm doing then all the anxiety goes away. And it's the same, I think, with teaching uh, children, you kind of, and I, I now have friends who are teachers who say, yeah, we're, uh, you know, getting ready, getting ready. What are I doing? I'm, well, I'm doing a dry run this morning on my first lesson. I'm, I'm trying stuff out. I'm wondering whether this will work. And whenever I've taught, which has not been that frequent, I come up with a lesson plan, which has like 30 things on it. <laughs> And I usually get through about the first one or two <laughs> because one thing leads to another. And if you're attentive and you know you're, you're good at what you do, then the anxiety goes away. But I guess anxiety and, and stage fright, is, it never goes away. But it's always that part that's beforehand. Like once you're out there and you're connected, do you find that that goes away, that you, you, you don't have that same sort of worry? Yeah, I mean, especially if it's something um, that you've, you've rehearsed enough to know where you are with it. Um, it's improvising is a little bit more difficult, more tentative, because you have to, um, you have to um, constantly ride the audience, especially if you're a solo performer too, which is a lot of what I do now. Uh, you have to ride the audience. I compare that to being a charioteer with however many people you're holding the reins off and you whoa, pull these people and well, no, those people are getting far. Wait a minute. There's a great quote that um, Robin Williams um, used to say. And I think it's in one of his one of his albums, actually, where he does step in a routine where he, he does step into my mind. And He's performing live at a comedy venue. And then suddenly the audience goes very quiet. And he says, I feel I've lost you. Then he says, step inside my mind. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah, yeah. does what it's like to be a comedian scrambling to keep the audience on the hook and on the leash and on, keep the reins taut. Um, and, and, and at the same time, keep coming up with material, especially if you're improvising. I was going to say, how, when, you know, as a clown or a comedian, how do you, some audiences are quieter than others. I imagine for most, you know, for everybody who's had that experience, but how do you deal with that unexpected silence? I'll you know, tell how, you that. Do you get more it, anxious or do you have a method to like be patient? Yeah, no, you, it, it, uh, well, the, the method, the, the technique I use is one which I learned um, when I was studying acting at university in England and my teacher, Clive Barker, who was not the novelist, but he was um, a, um, an actor and a writer. And he had worked with Joan Littlewood who did a What a Lovely War and um, major productions out at Stratford East. And he would say, when you don't get that reaction, when you don't feel that connection, go back to the rhythm, mm. back to where, what you know, the pacing and the rhythm works that you worked on. Mm -hmm. And they'll either get on board or not. And then the, the other phrase is let the audience on the bus. You have to let them on the bus. So you have to find a way to bring them on board, mm. um, you know, by tweaking the material, um, that you don't go after them. 
and I'll tell you this, this funny story. I did this once in a solo show. It was in New York City. Um, and uh, I was doing my show, um, Feast of Fools, which was um, various clown archetypes, comedy archetypes throughout the ages. Mm -hmm. And at one point I did this move or this gag of some kind, and there was no response from the person I was specifically addressing on the front row. And the per I, 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 and he was just like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, so, I, so I tried it again. I went after him again. And he just went. <laughs> and it's only after the show was over that someone told me that that guy had had an accident and he his jaw was wired shut. Oh, gee. <laughs> That's why he wasn't laughing. <laughs> he couldn't make any expression for you. <laughs> he was probably having a hilarious time, but try laughing like that. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. So you don't, you don't go after them. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got started? How did you choose mime and physical theater and Maybe even going back to your childhood, your education, your training. Well, this is all old news, right? Um, Not to us. Well, yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I don't know. So. <laughs> yeah, you've heard it all before. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I'll be back. What, oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> what I uh, what I found early on in in, in when I was a, a little child was that. If I could make people laugh, I would get approval. And it was, a, it became a survival mechanism. It's a, you know, I mean, I, I won't say this happened when I was two, but it, it, it's a way of dealing with the pain. Uh, I also was always um, ready to perform. My mother would look at me and say, stop showing off. Mm -hmm. I was a show off. And she would say, stop showing off. And then she'd look at the assembled guests and say, oh, isn't he awful? <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, uh, I can't control him. He'll just do it whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to do it, you know. And, and it so didn't, it didn't stop you, though. No, I didn't. No, uh, it, because I liked it, and and I, you know, people laughed, and people were. Uh, my aunts and uncles would say, "Oh, isn't he awful?" Meaning, isn't he? Isn't it great that he does that? that that's how they put it. Because it, this is from North Yorkshire, you know, in England. But then, you know, when I was in school, I was the class clown. There, go there. Um, but I also was pretty good at imitating my teachers, mm -hmm. and. All my classmates would say, do Mr. So-and-so, do Ms. So-and-so. <laughs> and I would do them and they were, you know, they would laugh. And oftentimes when I'd done them, you know, be, it, between lessons, and then the teacher that I'd just done came in, all my classmates would be howling and trying to stifle their laughs because what he, he or she did was exactly what I'd just done. Because I, <laughs> you know I, I spent a lot of time watching mm -hmm. yeah. and and the other thing that influenced me and as as one can see in my latest uh piece um what will i be when you when you grow up which i think james you slightly misquoted you said what will i be when i grow up it's oh. what will i it, what will i be when you grow up sorry um, about that yeah but, but it's it's a it's a sort of a comic line which refers to the fact that I don't know who I am now because um, I'm a grandfather. And when my grandchildren grow up, what will I be? Will I be, will I be handsome? Will I be rich? Will I be, you know, <laughs> the song goes, will, will I, what, how will they remember me? What will my legacy be? So in, uh, what was I saying? I was saying something about um, in that, in that latest show, um, I forget what I was, where I was going. Um, I know that okay. feeling. Yeah. 
Well, you were talking earlier, you were talking a moment ago about uh, the being the class clown and the imitation of the teachers and... Uh, what influenced you and how you got on this road to be a mime and a clown and physical theater artist. Yeah, well, also, oh, yeah. So one of the things that I talk about in that show is how, and this is a true story, how when I was in, in, in school, um, maybe about eight, as a big kid, one of the big kids came up to me in the school playground because I had, I had transferred schools and I was actually a pretty good speller and a reader at the time, better than many of the other children in the, in the class I was placed in. And I remember the, um, the teacher had asked me, uh, he had heard that I was supposed to be a good speller and he, and, uh, um, we were talking about, um, uh, some religious thing. I can't remember where it was. <laughs> where it's going, but um, uh, I don't know. Let's say the word was contravention. And um, so he said, "Can you? Sp can anybody here spell that?" And I put my hand up, and he said, "Come up here and write it on the board." And I did, and it was correct. Mm. And then, so that went around the class, and then it went around the school. That this new kid who just transferred from London um to the north could um or from the north to to the south could spell and this kid came up to me in the school playground and said spell diarrhea <laughs> <laughs> or I'll thump you <laughs> so and what I did was I didn't try I just fell flat on the ground in front of him. I just went, I just like jackknifed onto my back. <laughs> and, and he couldn't do anything. He couldn't thump me because I was already flat on the ground. Some and animals other, do that. Some animals do that, right? They, yeah, that was one of Martha Graham's, Martha Graham's uh, elements when she was choreographing. She would always talk, like Martha Graham, the, the pioneer dancer, had her her performers had great necks. She'd always talk about, re, like some animals when they're about ready to fall to the prey, they they trick them by just revealing their neck and laying back, you know. And that it sounds like that's what you did <laughs> to c confuse yeah. the attacker. <laughs> yeah, it's top dog underdog thing. Yeah, um, yeah, I, part of that too. But um, so uh, falling down became a go-to posture for me, as it were. You know, I, I would make people laugh by falling down. I know what I was going to do, tell you is because um, in this show, what will I do? Um, what will I be when you grow up? One of the uh, influences I say in the show, well, you know, I fell down, you know, what will, will my grandchildren be? Will they be violinists, you know, priests? Because that's the other things that I explore in the show. Violinist, priests, fallers down. Whoever, yeah. made, whoever made a living falling down. <laughs> I made a living falling down. That's yeah. yeah. your career. And so when, and I asked the question by then talking about my uncle Horace, who was, um, he was sort of an amateur showman, singer, he'd sing and, and he'd tell jokes and he'd also, had, he had these long monologues, rhyming monologues that he did, often very uh, edgy, scatological, you know. Off the top uh, of his head. The no, the no, they, oh. no, 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 they, they were written. And the other major thing that I use in the show that I come back to is that one of the things he did was he had this uh, eight millimeter projector which he would put on a, on a chair, on a table, on a stool in the backyard, pointing in through his kitchen to the wall. And he'd show eight millimeter silent films of comedians from the 20s, 30s and 40s to uh -huh. me. Uh -huh. mm. and, and, and I would- Only you? You were the, you were the, the chosen one to, to witness this? Me and or my my mom and dad, but yeah. that was one of the things that he did, and you know then I started to watch Keaton and Chaplin and 
the other things I did were, were to imitate comedians I saw on television or um, reiterate, as my dad did all the time, jokes that he'd heard on the radio. Mm -hmm. So all the popular comedians of the time, and there's an interesting tie up here because the, the, guy, the guy who wrote this, there's a guy who wrote a book, John Fisher wrote a book called Funny Way to Be a Hero. Mm -hmm. And the book is about English uh, popular comedians from the 1900s, the 1800s, and then through the 19, through the 20th century. It's a really good book. It's sort of like a Bible, and I recommend it to anyone who gets a hand of it. Uh, there's some great photos in it. But John Fisher produced... The Parkinson show on television, which was Michael Parkinson, Sir Michael Parkinson now, who was a Northern comedian, a uh, Northern interviewer, had, had, had a voice like that a little bit, and he would interview everybody. You'd have Paul McCartney, you'd have Stella Black, you'd have, you know, anybody who came through was on the Parkinson show. John Fisher produced that. John Fisher came and saw me at the Roundhouse in London, mm -hmm. um, when we did the Pickle Family Circus, this was probably 1977, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, and he came back, back uh, after, he got a hold of me somehow by phone right then, and invited me to come on the Paul Daniels show, which is the show that he also produced uh -huh. for Thames Television. So that's how I got to do the multi, what we call the multiple sniffs routine, which was a routine where my character, Mr. Sniff, multiplied. Yeah. And, it's and hilarious. There are lots of them coming out of trunks and coming around the scenery and through the backdrop. And eventually we all run around, and there's six of us, I think, including my, at that time, two-year-old son, Jonah, who was a two-foot tall, three-foot tall Mr. Sniff with the nose and the hat and and the cane. Um, and, and so, um, but that's how I got to be on the Paul Daniel show. That's a, it's a wonderful clip. It's so funny and so surprising. It was, it was yeah. much. What would have, um, yeah. like, it, it seems that you've been influenced <clears throat> quite a bit by your upbringing and your relatives and your environment. So when you were about 22 or 23, what would have been some of your influences that you, um, was there any any important people or? Uh, I remember well. I was in Paris then studying uh, mime at the uh, Ecole de Mime Etienne de Cru, mm -hmm. uh, de Cru's school, where um, and, and de Cru of course taught Marceau and Jean Louis Barrault uh, and me, um, <laughs> and uh, many other people. Many many people went through his school. Uh, and living in Paris, you know, I, uh, I had a lot of spare time. It was 1968, the riots were just about to happen or had just happened. But one of the things that I did was I'd go to the Cinematheque and you could get an all day pass or an all day ticket. And I'd watch about four Keaton movies at the Cinematheque in the Palais de Chaillot. And it just, I'd just sit there and let this stuff wash over me, you know. He was, he was good at falling down. Keaton was good at falling down. Yes. He was, I can see the connection, good. yeah at falling down until the end of his life yeah there are there are, there are extraordinary uh shots of him falling when he was in his late 70s mm. um still doing it because you know he well he's he, first of all his body was in incredible shape second of all he had started when he was like you know one year old mm -hmm. <laughs> in his in his parents uh act three kittens when his dad had sewed the um, suitcase handle into the back of his clothes. So that <laughs> right, right. I see. Well, he, was, he had a career of falling down too, just like you. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I think his career was a little more, more significant. What, uh, yeah. w did you have other characters besides Sniff? Was that your first kind of crafted archetypal clown character? Or did you have other explorations or, or, or how did Sniff Mr. Sniff well, originate about that time or later? Yeah, no, it was it was a little bit a little bit earlier. Yeah, uh, about the time when uh, well, I, I 
1974, um, there was a, a, a guy, um, Peter Frankham, who I'd worked with in, in, uh, in England and uh, had done some acrobatics work at the uh, uh, Gymnase du Cirque, which is also where I learned to throw back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a Romanian teacher. Um, uh it was it was amazing. Um, his name was Tudor Bono, T U D O N O, <laughs> -N -O Tudor Bono, and I still have his card actually. And, and you'd go in into the Gymnase du Cirque, and um, I'm, I'm rabbiting on now. Just I, I, stop me if you've heard it. We'll control you, you. We'll control you when we want to. So, so yeah. Um, I mean, it's not relevant to where, what I was talking about in a certain sense, but because I'm coming to your question about how I came to Mr. Schnitt. Yeah. So I worked with the crew and I'd done, I had done a lot of street theater uh, in London, uh, children's street theater, participatory street theater. Um, we would do it on playgrounds and, you know, in schools and uh, recreation sites um, and at special festivals. And, working with children and I had a character were you being we, mostly were you mostly solo or were you working with other no, no, no. this was a group this was a group okay. of people uh -huh. we had a company called the dogs troop d-o-g-g -G, uh -huh. apostrophe s dogs troop um which was an, a creation of this guy ed berman who started the company that I was when in at the time interaction that I had joined Interaction was a community arts trust that basically um, worked through all the arts in, uh, in various community settings and non-traditional uh, locations. And um, the Dogs Troupe did these participatory street theaters. The first show that we did was called Moon Men. And um, it was essentially a show about immigrants because, or aliens. Uh -huh. And what alien, it, what that means. Mm -hmm. And so the, another longer story, but I won't go into it. These costumes were found outside the London Palladium, the, the big vaudeville, uh, you know, the, the go-to theater for uh, all popular entertainers in England that's still there, the London Palladium. Uh, and it's a major theater. But these, they were throwing these costumes out from... Uh, something called, I think it was called Man in the Moon. And a very popular uh, British comedian was the star of the show. His name was Charlie Drake. Mm -hmm. And he was really short. And they found, they, they were throwing these costumes out and, and somebody from our company at, at the time was driving by and said, what are you doing and throwing away? You, well, can we keep them? Sure, here. So we got all these kind of moon creature costumes, which were like three-eyed <laughs> three foam rubber, Michelin men look alike, moon costumes with antennae. And plus there was a, uh, an astronaut costume. The astronaut costume had been for Charlie Drake, the, the, uh, the comedian. And I got the astronaut costume. So I was, Dr. Why What? And Dr. <laughs> Why What had found these aliens that arrived from the moon and were asking the children, how can we welcome them? What do we do? What do we do with them? Mm -hmm. And that was part of that. And, and through a series of different interactions and game structures, we worked with the moon men. And, and, and it was the idea was to enliven and enable the children's you know, participation and fun and um expression did this so, doctor sniff sniff the aliens is this where no it, sniff it, it, came well yeah so he was he was a guy who um who, who was very voluble he was he had a german accent so that was my cover that was my vocal mask if you want um and and i would work with the kids and work with them with the moon creatures and ask them to do certain things anyway so when I came to America, <laughs> this guy, Peter Frankham, who had worked with me on these projects in Eng England, he was, I, I found him one day, I just bumped into him. I had no idea he was in America, but he was doing fire breathing, fire flame eating mm -hmm. in 
at, a, um, at the Grant Street Crafts Fair in San Francisco. And I said, it's Peter, oh my goodness, look at it. Peter, hi, oh, he said, hi, and we talked. He said, and then, so we, he, we hung out a little bit and he said, come out, come do stuff with us. I said, nah, I'll be. He said, yeah, come on. And so I became what I call the barker of this little troupe that we put together, which had this mad French percussionist who played lots of percussion instruments, um, a banjo player named Peter, I believe, Jacob Benson, who was a Danish mime who had studied at Lecoq, and Peter who had studied at Lecoq, and another woman, two, two other women, uh, Brenda and, uh, oh, what was her name? I can't remember. She was, Brenda was American, and then this other woman was Swiss, and I don't think Brenda had gone to Lecoq, but this other, the Swiss woman had been a Lecoq student. So there's like five of us, so five or six of us, when we just perform in the streets in San Francisco when you could still do that. Um, and we would pass the hat. When I then came to, um, that's where I met, where you say you met me, James, because we took that little group that was performing in the streets, was, we called it the New Depression Follies. Yeah. It was, it was 1973 and there was a, the recession happening. We thought yeah. we, I would hand out fake $3 bills. Um, <laughs> and, and, and we went to the mime festival yeah. at La, La Crosse, Wisconsin in 1974 at Viterbo College. Mm -hmm. And we sort of crashed it. The New Depression Follies were not invitees, but we decided we would just go and see people. And we saw Pierre Bilan, Philippe Gaulier, we saw Dimitri, and we snuck into all these events. And then we would go into the cafeteria where we could go, because people had to eat, and we would do bits of our show. Yeah. And then we would do it outside, outside the festival in the street and tell people we we're going to do our bit. And so we did that. Did you and stay for the whole two weeks? I don't remember. I don't remember. No, yeah. we were on route. We, we had, we had, we had bought a Dodge Polara station wagon, <laughs> 400 bucks. And then we took it from San Francisco. <coughs> we took the, the thermostat out of the radiator so it wouldn't boil over in the desert. We got all, we get all the way to, um, lacrosse and then we go to madison um and then we go we go south to um or, or, uh, i think it was austin and, and and sort of did a big circle and came back okay. shortly after that peter and i would worked with the neighborhood arts program in san francisco performing uh ske sketches and songs for senior citizens groups and uh, and schools as part of the neighborhood arts program. During that time, um, and I remember one Christmas day, we had seven Christmas dinners because we yeah. had seven senior citizens and each time they insisted on giving us dinner. So about six Christmas puddings in, we decided we would politely decline the next Christmas dinner. Um, and then the CETA program happened under Jimmy Carter, Comprehensive Employment Training Act, which was the 1974 version of um, the, uh, the bailout acts that we're having now in the, uh, you know, uh, American Jobs Act. That's essentially what it was, but it was not as big as we have that the, the, the administration wants to um, start now. And we got hired, librarians, musicians, out of work actors, um, poets, writers, archivists. It was sort of a WPA, a mini WPA, Works Progress Administration from the 30s, transferred to the 1970s. And under that program, partially, the Pickle Family Circus was started. Larry Pizzoni mm -hmm. and um, Peggy Snyder put together a circus and they were out of the San Francisco mime troupe. They left that. Larry was a circus buff. They were both amazing jugglers. And uh, Cecil McKinnon 
what made the trio of them the pickle family jugglers and they had been together for quite a while and um they would give do shows in sheep's meadow in in um in new york city and in, in um, central park and as a result of that um and getting these cedar jobs bill Irwin, larry pizzoni and i got these cedar jobs and i was working with a group called tail spinners at the time which was a seniors performing group which had seniors as part of the performers as, as a number members of the performing group so we'd work on stage with seniors telling their story and mm. doing doing fairy tales and folk tales that made sense to seniors and we'd take them around to senior centers and lunch counters and um, day centers um, and Larry said I want you in the circus I want you what I said oh, I'll come and audition and I auditioned for Larry and he, he asked me to join the circus and the first so then I had to quit the tail spinners because I couldn't do both companies it was too much and we were on tour anyway with with the circus toured and and so the first character I did was a character in the circus called Harry Kershaw. Ker as in uh, uh, Ker as in dog, Shaw as in the playwright. That's what, how he introduced himself, Kershaw. <laughs> um, and he was one of those classic circus uh, characters who wants to be in the show. <clears throat> and so I would have I had this garish plaid suit. I think I saw that actually. I think I remember this character now. Yeah. 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 And he would he would throw popcorn and spill his popcorn. No, and, I remember this. Yeah. And 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 he eventually he he badgered the the uh, ringmaster to the extent where he was allowed to. Yes. All right. You could do something. And so what I did was I uh, I got up on a roll of bola which is a cylinder with a plank on top that you have to balance. And, yeah. you know, most kids can learn that fairly fast. And I learned it, but I also played the violin. I, I played the violin on it, on the roller bowler. And that was my routine. So Harry Kershaw. Then Larry said, we need to get another character for you. That we, Let's see, let's work it, work it. So we worked it and we came up with the idea of a, a strange character who was going to be a foil for um bill Irwin's willie the clown and he was a wicked little character with <laughs> a, we found we found that um, and, um larry had this book acrobats and mountebanks which is a very famous book uh, about uh popular performers and popular performance uh throughout the, the ages in europe um and it had lots of photos and drawings in it one of the drawings had a guy with the big glasses and we came up with the idea because of comedia that we should try it with a big nose which is a, a comedia mask with a big nose without the mask yeah so i just had just had the nose like a big sort of um red sausage on the end of my nose so it was a proboscis so it was kind of quite vulgar and rude and and we also then said, well, let's put him a bit like the character that I'd played in the, as the Barker in the New Depression Follies, fingerless gloves and a long coat. And Larry said, let's make the coat yellow because that's the good circus color. And we give him a bowler hat because we all wore bowlers. And, um, and we would have him with no pants. So there was a sort of like a, a, a flasher kind of uh indication. You had big shoes though you had you, you had big big shoes yeah, big, we all had big clown shoes yeah. yeah um uh but he but he just had red underwear long red underwear on under his <laughs> so but that and it, and so people say oh he's a flash no but he wasn't it was much more like pantaloni who had always it was the character of in the um Commedia dell'arte, the old man, the, the Il Vecchio, the old man, who had actually a long nosed mask, a red cap, and um, he had a black coat, often uh, long, 
and underneath they're sort of long red trousers, but, mm -hmm. but tight. Mm -hmm. So I sort of was like that and red and white striped socks and big clown shoes. So it was a, a complete mishmash, but, but Sniff, and he became Mr. Sniff because the way he investigated everything was by smelling it. So <laughs> he, would, yeah, yeah. he would sniff everything, you know, sort of like, um, I don't need that. Um, the character was very active, very active, you know, very yeah, he, energetic. Yeah. yeah. He didn't he didn't speak. He was a silent clown. Silent. Yeah. yeah. yeah Willie the clown didn't speak either. So and what no. was what yeah. was Larry's character? The third Larry year. was the Lorenzo Pickle. He was a straight yeah. man, more of more of a straight man, correct? Somewhat, but he did yeah. some pretty funny, you know, you had, you know, uh, there's no straight men, really. I mean, you bat, you bat it back and forth. No. Uh, our famous signature piece, <clears throat> which actually was pre Mr. Sniff for me, was a piece in the circus called Three Musicians. And um, I remember it that had, yeah. it had Willie, the clown, Bill, uh, and he did. We all spoke with Italian accents. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get a the chair. No, you don't need a chair. You need an instrument. Get a the instruments. And uh, we would come on stage with a tuba, a big bass drum with a cymbal on the top, and uh, trombone. And um, I was sort of like a. I had a beard at the time, so as I, I, I was called, what was I called? Be, uh, beardy or something. And, and Willie was Willie, and Larry was uh, Lorenzo. And Larry had a fat suit on. Yeah. So Larry, Larry was the, the, the fat guy. I was the fast moving little guy who kept getting in, get a sort of stand laurel. And, um, and then, and Willie was Willie, you know, he was sort of the. He was the more kind of slippery guy. Yeah. Yeah. But he, yeah. Well, people talk, uh, they say, you know, there was fire, there was earth, and there was yeah. air. I remember uh, Larry Pizzoni slamming down his spot on his back. Am I wrong about that? He would do a fall yeah. where he would really hit the ground hard, like right on his back. You know, it was called a character. 108. Yeah. So 108, where you actually, it's a, like a front somersault where you under rotate. So you don't right. actually land on your feet, you land on your back. Right. And, and he was very good at that. What, uh, and I'll, you know, when you guys were touring, do you have one great, story a touring experience or a, a disaster story that happened during these these golden years of the pickle family uh well i i mean there are probably tons that i yeah know, but i mean we drove into portland oregon um like a, two days after mount st helens blew oh my all the wow. streets were covered in um about that much deep of talcum powder yeah from ash from Mount St. Helens and all our uh, all our cars were we had to change the air filters before we left so we we drove in and and and, and um you know we did the show set it up did the show and then got the heck out of there all like so fast because you had, we had masks on and everything. It was really hard. That, that one, um, that's pretty depressing. Did uh, Sniff's <laughs> nose uh, ever break or in the show or did the band, the band break? Did you find yeah. yourself without, without a nose ever? Oh, oh, there's one very famous one where I forgot to put it on. <laughs> <laughs> I, went out and, I went out on stage and, and Bill and Larry just looked at me. <laughs> I didn't have the nose. And Larry stopped and went backstage, got the nose, came out, took off my hat, put the nose on and put the hat back on. And I'm, <laughs> I'm sure if the band were smart, they would have given us a fanfare at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was such that, a part, it was such a part of you, you didn't even know that you hadn't put it on? No, I don't know what it was. I, <laughs> um, it may have been the second show of the day in our, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you never don't remember to put your nose on. I don't know why it did. Anyway, so that was weird. How do you, uh, oh. You hear that? Uh, oh. What's going um, on, Michael? It's time for a gift. 
I forgot to uh, ask you, Jeff, did you have the gift that we sent in the mail? Is it nearby? Oh, oh yes. It's yes. time for you to open this. I know there's nothing in here because it's a mind gift. <laughs> You're so smart. I, I'll drink. I'll drink to that. <laughs> yes, the little mind to that. Do I open it now? Yes. Gee, you, you got a minute? Gee, it's Make burning. sure you read all the small print because there's some information that we don't want you to lose. Do not of. open on air until on air with my radio podcast. Care here. <laughs> Very detailed instructions. Wow. No, it's a Mr. Smith. Two, two, Jeff Boyle. Phase one. Da, da, da. Reverse dunking procedure. <laughs> nice. I can see you've been working with Zoom for a while. You had that angle on that trajectory, trajectory really good. Make sure you read the card. No, 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 Jeff, no, no. Well, we don't have a liability waiver. We can't have you eating the what vacuum. What am I going to do with all this, all this, this plastic stuff? There's a card. <laughs> you said I have to read that first? I would Thank suggest that. Thank you for that. joining us on Mime Radio. Please act this, accept this gift from the Mime Museum collection as a token of our thanks. Hosted by, et cetera, et cetera. The Mime Museum. Description. <laughs> what is it? What is that description? The description is a small bottle containing smells saved by Mr. Sniff. Vintage, very rare. Open with caution. <laughs> is there a is there a, a code uh, on it or a, a item number? Yeah. This is from the this is from the Mime Museum. I think Mike is trying to get rid of some of the objects, and um, he's the curator. Yeah. We're running out of space and time. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's there's some uh, yeah. It says B B Y O. There's a number bunch of numbers on it. Well, that's. But, Yes, that was a good That's one. That's the identification, yeah. Well, thank you guys. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna dare I open it? Yeah, see what if it's familiar. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <sighs> <laughs> That's gonna go good with our audio show with the sounds of pleasure. Yeah. I'll escape. So, so Jeff, I have a couple of questions for you. What when you go to create something? Oh my goodness, it's flying towards us. Whoosh. I, I got an image of you when you were a kid right there, man. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, when we you, grew up in that generation of the spaceships. Well, well, no, of just things animated things performing in this in your solitude you know so anyway go ahead karen uh, yeah <laughs> now he's doing a little tap, tap dance for us awesome so so it's actually it's like obviously you're you you find, <laughs> you find a lot of ideas through play it seems <laughs> when you go to create a piece how do you, how do you what is your process um and and how do you start and does it start with an image, an idea, a costume, a, a concept, and I'm sure all, over all of those things, you know, uh, depend. Uh, it, it, so, you know, I've now got four grandchildren and one of them was is about a month old. One of them is five, 
six months old, almost six months old. So the other ones are four and five. And, you know, they're just great inspiration. So like, you know, this, this will become an animal, you know, it, 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 it has an animus, you know, oh, oh, I'm on my back. I can't roll over. Uh, uh, oh. Okay, thank you. I'll see you later. Okay. Isn't, isn't this one of the aspects of clowning, how you, how objects become, have spirits and are, like you say, well, animus, you know, that. They, they, and, but they also a lot of what I try and work on is, is visual puns. So one thing, you know, becomes something else. Like I'm standing right, I'm sitting right here next to my music stand, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what I use to put my um, um, phone on when I'm doing some filming. And one of the things that Mr. Sniff, he had a routine where he, he was he, trying to put his music stand up. And I remember one, at one point I would pretend that it was a radar, a radar, you know, thing mm -hmm. where, you know, going around us. So there's a, there was a pun on, on, on what it was. It, uh, uh, surrealism is a great kind of springboard for me. The whole, I mean, I love the surrealist art movement. Um, Magritte, obviously, and, 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 and the Dadaists where, yeah. I mean, you know, what's Marcel Duchamp's urinal, which becomes a drinking fountain. <laughs> you know, um, when he reconfigures it. Uh, and many, many artists do that. It, it, and it also speaks to the dream world mm -hmm. where dreams are and nightmares are sort of explorations of the non-conscious life, which is, which are what clowns at their best uh, access mm -hmm. on behalf of the audience, mm -hmm. you know. So you're um, almost you're like you're allowing the audience to enter their own minds in a sense by what you're doing into. It, it, it yeah. could it could be, and you're doing it in a secure way. So, which is why possibly one of the reasons they laugh because they recognize the surrealism of the dream world and what it is says about their own unconscious because mm -hmm. you're accessing as the clown your unconscious and giving it to them and saying isn't your unconscious like this too mm -hmm. and I invited to say yes is it scary for you because i'm i have it too so it shouldn't be so scary we can look at it Mm -hmm. and confront it and maybe control it or at least come to terms with it and not have it be anxiety producing and threatening mm -hmm. and anxiety is another area that i use in terms of um springboard for things yeah. you know uh, the when things go wrong even little things and the solution is always the next problem. There is no free lunch. No, there's nothing is perfect. And the clown is constantly telling us that. And even, and I'm a recovering perfectionist. And I get very, <laughs> very, I get very, very upset when things are not right. I hear you. I hear I'm you. an only child as well. So. And I, yeah, that's not, interesting. Yeah, I'm good. an only child. I'm an only child, and I have the same thought about that perfection. I wonder if there's a link there. Yeah, I think so. You know, yeah. I, I, never, I didn't, I didn't share my toys, and I always kept them the way I wanted them. I hated to do that. I, I felt all the kids in the neighborhood could not animate them like I could with detail. You know, I don't know how you felt, but it was my mind was so far ahead into the textures of the worlds you know well, to me it was more like i didn't want them to mess things up exactly that's exactly it that's exactly it so how is it, so jeff how is it different now when you're playing with the other your own kids your your grandchildren they're you're playing with them and their play are you are you able to get into their playtime with them you yeah no one of my 
one of the things that I try to do and not always successfully is let them lead. There is no wrong turn. Yeah. You know, when the knight in the castle decides he needs a record player, <laughs> it's okay. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yes, say yes. And, and Jeff, isn't that surrealism? Isn't that what you say you base your stuff on and yeah. love? Mm -hmm. You know, so we, the, the, the knights in the castle decide that they're, they need a building site. And they're suddenly they're making a railway. Hmm. You know, and then there's a boat has to come. So we have to create water. And well, okay, yeah. we'll have a boat around. No, no, no. There's a river that comes past the farm. What farm? <laughs> the farm. Oh, okay. We get the farm stuff out. But wait, what is that landing in the farm there? A spaceship. What what are, how the what do the knights say about the spaceship? So you're giving the mind, you get, you're giving the imagination freedom to fly. You know, there's not, you can't yeah. shape it. You're giving, yeah. giving permission to enter this world of surrealism, which brings ideas yeah. and concepts. I, I, but I mean, it's totally traditional in a certain sense. I mean, as you like it, the shipwreck, the tempest, Don Quixote, mm. those windmills are giants. Mm. You know? Yeah. All right. Yeah, what, okay. how do you, how, I'm Sancho Panza. I'm hungry. How do you, how do you, how, you know, clients first? How do you define what what you've done in your career? How do you define your art? Are, are you a clown? Are you an actor? Are you uh, uh, you know pro, pro, uh, you to provoke things? Are you a storyteller? How do you define? Do you have a particular take on that, or is it I'm an imitator? Imitator. I imitate people and I, as best I can as an actor, become them and, 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 and um, perform credible um, re reenactments of behavior. So um, how does clown fit into that? Well, you, you know, you might, you got my, you have my phrase that you, you yeah. use. Tell, tell us the phrase. A lot of people maybe haven't heard that. Yeah. The phrase is when I'm, um, um, when I'm acting, I'm not always clowning, but when I'm clowning, I'm always acting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always thought the clown was the consummate actor. In order to be a clown at all, you must be a an exquisite actor, you know. And that to me, that says it all right there, you know. So, yeah. but um, Jeff, you're also a writer because you've written shows that are not just like short clown vignettes, but they have these long through, through lines and, and ideas. How do you, what, what gets you started with a, a, a show that you, you have a, a bigger idea? Usually some kind of need to explore um, some kind of un, unanswered questions that are, come from my past, my childhood, my youth, um, decisions that were made on, for me and by me, people I've known that I'd need to figure out what, what was going on with them, um, anxieties that I still have that I need to sort of figure out how, what, what they are and how they're, how, how I can tame them. Mm -hmm. do, you ever, do you ever figure it out? You know, I'm not saying, I wouldn't say that I figure it out by doing the show, but the shows relate to something very real. They're not just, but, but all acting is, has to be, has to relate to something real. You know, if I'm doing Jocks or Daily in Juno and the Paycock by Sean O'Casey, then you know, I'm seeing lots of people that I've met and using my memory observation of them uh, to recreate a character, Joxer Daly, who is, wow, that I really believe that that guy is like that, you know. And <laughs> how, how is your age? You know, we're both in our 70s now. How is age 
changed you or made you look at the work in, in a different way? Is it for me? I'm finding I have more revelations, and I'm the pure truth is seems to be coming to me as I get older. What, what, how about you? Um, I I think that I become more forgiving of people, having mm. having um, having tried to really um, as in as mo as, as most clear and perfect way I can imitate imperfect people. And you figure out that's why they do that. Or this makes it hard for them to do X. Mm -hmm. So I need to have that as an underpinning for this character set. I mean, and also just doing characters um, is, is uh, more interesting in some ways now than it's ever been. You know, maybe I should be Chekhov. Why is it more interesting? Why, why do you think it's more interesting? Uh, it's because um, of, uh, I think just maybe more figuring out why people do stuff. Mm. It sounds like and, you're, you're talking a little bit about like the empathy side of acting where you're actually like inside someone so you begin to feel why they do like and that's why you can have a little more forgiveness for them yeah yeah empathy is a good word to use i mean it's a bit overused these days but um it, it's important um and um it it also it it also is to do with a great feeling of achievement and joy that I get when people's eyes are like open and they're just smiling at if I get it right mm -hmm. and, and how well that I do something as a as a performer as yes that's accurate yes that's right mm. so that's true you know, and we laugh because we recognize it and we're yeah. safe. We're in the theater or we're in nowadays more likely in front of a screen. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I'm thinking of things like the one of the characters that I, two of the characters that I did, three of the characters that I did for <laughs> Teatro Zinzani. I did Volodya, who was a Russian character because I happen to speak Russian. Um, and I could do it, and I would pull the wool over Russian audience members. They would, <laughs> and, 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 and they'd say, Atkudavoy, where are you from? And they would tell me in Russian, you know, and, and we'd start talking, and, and, and they'd ask me where I was from in Russia. Because they didn't think, uh, this guy got to be Russian, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Mrs. Bracken, the 65-year-old Scottish lady who summoned the herring, so to be caught by the herring fishermen in Scotland, she's based in my on my aunt and my mother, yeah. and she was full, 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 you know, trans, uh, uh, trans, not not transvestite in terms of like you know, um, camp, but full regalia. She was, people would think that I was a woman. Yes, unbelievable. Uh, now and then. And then the third one was 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 um, uh, red red bottoms the vaudeville uh, guy. Oh, he would talk like that, you know. I said, How? and he did these kind of Henny Youngman like jokes. Yeah, yeah. You know? No, I've seen you do that work. That's wonderful. Now I've heard you say that. Um, t uh, oh no. Oh, it's that time. Rapid fire. It's rapid fire time. What's so that? I mean? can see you're really, uh, you know, impressed and, you know, impressed and you're, you're a cool <laughs> he customer. Looks, he looks um, a little nervous, James. No shock. No shock. He's a little nervous, maybe. Yeah. Um, sort of like maybe Joan of Arc was as she was led to the stake. I don't know. But uh, I'm going to give mine. you some. What? I have mine medium rare. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give you uh, some 
words rapid fire and you're going to give me rapid answers in one word like a word association oh, I have a geez. list here so uh, just off the top of your head as fast as you can go this is what my doctor does yeah that's right so yeah, uh, a kleenex this is called rapid fire are you ready <laughs> <laughs> all right here we go just answer one word, or if it's an exclamation, that's fine. If you get, you know, whatever comes out of you. So here we go. Feet. Smelly. Arms. Smelly. Spotlight. Basking. Stage. Fright. Hands. Knees and bumps a daisy. <laughs> Eyes. Seeing into the depths. That's more than one word. That's okay. Fourth wall. Fifth roof. <laughs> Sweat. Work. Child. Love. I, I, maybe I should say these more neutrally. Am, am I like triggering something? Uh, elder. Abuse. <laughs> <laughs> Costume. I'm going to write something down on that one. No, costume. Uh, minimal. Props. Uh, suggested. 8 p.m. Is it 8 p.m.? 8 p.m. What's that? It's an hour in the day. What you say? Eight. 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 Oh, eight. I thought you said 8 p.m. American public media. 8 p.m. Uh, 10.30 always comes. <laughs> Mask. Forget it. Red nose. Don't need it. Age. Appropriate. Failure. Always. Critic. Refuse. Teacher. <laughs> Uh, mentor. Fame. What is it? Language. Voice. Clown. Actor. Mime. Clown. Future. Past. Now. Then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Beautiful. <laughs> Speaking of teacher, just real quickly, I know you don't teach much by choice. Can you say in two sentences, I think there's one, maybe I'll quote you myself. You said my performance is my classroom. You said that once I heard you say that. And that's what you believe, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> well, the, the, yeah. Uh, the performance is, is the lecture, is the, uh, if you're watching it closely and, and if I'm doing a good one, it's all in there. You know, it's like, it, our observation is so crucial. And then trying something that you've, that you've observed and trying to make it your own. I mean, I'd say to people, take any of my gags, because I've probably taken half of them anyway. But make them your own. Mm -hmm. Don't do me. Do you doing the gag. Find yeah. the inside of the gag or the move or whatever it is, you know. Yeah, yeah. If people want to do my three-legged dance, for instance, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't stop them. You can't cop copyright an idea. Mm. And anyway, I don't believe in copyright of intellectual property. You know, it should be free and available. Mm. So, but... But do do try and make something of it for yourself, not just um, a copy, mm -hmm. because it's not a commodity. It's a process, mm -hmm. and it's an it, it's something you. Um, it's like putting on putting on a costume. It's be, you put on. You inhabit a gag rather than do a gag.
Yeah, like that's a great yeah. word. You inhabit, yeah. So, um, what do you think uh, you have as a legacy? What will you leave behind you? I mean, that's a part of what you were thinking about when you were writing your most recent show. Yeah. Um, I think fun and imagination. Um, you know, with my um, my oldest grand grandson, we we instituted something called gag night. Mm. We basically, you know, we have movie night, we have ice cream night, we have walk night, we have gag night. <clears throat> Great. And um, I'll show him some gags, or and and we'll and he'll come up with gags mm -hmm. it's about just letting this go, you know. Mm -hmm. Going to that surreal place, that place of the imaginary, you know, and it's not a sentimental thing. It's not sort of like, it's not escape. That's what is important. It's nothing to do with escaping from the real world that we live in, but it's to do with facing it and being able to negotiate, uh, to navigate it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. navigation and learning navigation and and i hope i leave the le a legacy of um something which i'm finding more and more frustrating which is the legacy of work that you know i i wrote a piece the other day well a few weeks back um where i play my dad mm -hmm talking to my son, his grandfather. I play his grandfather. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I put it out there and he said, yeah, it's good. There's some good stuff there. And, but he didn't say, yes, it's fantastic. Oh my God. And I thought, yeah, it's, cause it's only a first draft and I need to work on it. Mm -hmm. And I've been working on it. I mean, I'm trying to film it, you know, and was Chekhov who said, oh, with what, oh, with what rubbish I began, with what rubbish, something like that. I can't remember the words. It wasn't rubbish, but it was, oh, with what dreck, dr dr not dreck, uh, tr trash, I think mm. Chekhov said, oh, with what trash I began, with what trash. And the, and idea, the idea that you have to, you work on something, you have to keep coming back to it. I mean, that's something that I think young people, they're very impatient and they want instant gratification. And the idea that it takes a while, it takes a whole lifetime of experience to, to, to bring these things. And then once you have the idea to work it and work it and work it until it really does make people grab hold of it. Yeah, so, I mean, it is, it is about, well, so there's another poet or writer, uh, for what's her name? Can't remember. But she talks about shitty first drafts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have the shitty first draft. Oh yeah. And then you know, I well, I have this other process which which and I've uh, maybe I've spoken to James about it. Where in rehearsal, I go from something which I call "Don't look." like a kid, no, my sandcastle isn't ready yet. Don't look mm -hmm. to, and you have to go from don't look to watch this. <laughs> yes, yes. And that's a good, uh, it, it's sometimes takes a while to go yeah. from don't look, watch this. But until you get to watch this where you feel I've got it now. And I, I've, I feel when I'm working on a piece now that I have these little epiphanies where they, where it gels. And I say, I say basically in my body and in my mind, I say, yes, mm -hmm. yes, uh, that works. That's right. There's a rightness to it, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and struggling to get to that. And, and, and what you were saying, uh, it takes a lifetime, but 
I find I'm less patient now with <laughs> going, going to uh, watch this. I'm, I'm more likely to say, um, d don't look, don't look, ah, oh, never mind, just watch this. You know, so how's, yeah. uh, isn't this good enough? And, and I say, no, you can keep your own high standards. Mm -hmm. you know, don't lower your standards when you look at some, when you, when you criti critical awareness of other people's work has to also apply to oneself. Do you find Don't that um, less? Do you find that now, like I find myself sort of uh, creating the ideas and acting upon ideas in my mind that's satisfactory to me and pleasurable, where before when I was younger, I would actually produce the work. But now I'm I'm very comfortable with almost imagining what could be, and that's enough for me. Then I go on to another idea. I don't know if I'm preparing myself for the big exit or what, but <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I don't feel driven to get the work out, but it has to be good and has to be have a high standard, like you say. But yet I'm willing to find pleasure in just the thought of it a little more now than maybe I was before in my life. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I have a friend who is a writer in England and, you know, we were talking about writing, writing new material and he's a playwright and he's written a lot of stuff. And uh, he said, oh, he's thinking about doing a play, a play about X. And he said, eh, but I'm not sure I really want to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't need, don't need to do that. No. Yeah. Time is short for us now. Like, you know, I bet maybe I'd rather be doing this other thing now, you know, so. there, there's this great uh, poster I have of, um, um, uh, was it Mélenchon, the, the Nadar, the, um, uh, the photographer, the French photographer in the 1800s. Um, uh, uh, and and it's, it's a picture of Pierrot that somebody he's using a, a, a Mélenchon, I think, is a mime guy, and he's got this picture of you know this Pierrot kind of, thing. and it says um, Nad, it's Nadar, the creative years, mm. eighteen sixty four to eighteen sixty eight. What? <laughs> what? Wait. I've been doing this for 50 years and I'm still not done. I yeah. got more stuff. I did and it's like, what do they, what do they, does anybody say that about you? Well, he used to be great. Uh, or this is the back end of, is this is down the hill? Once he did these great things and she did these great things and, you know, so it's a little scary. The idea that the creative years is only that number. Yeah, I, I can't accept that. I don't. I don't know. I, I, I feel the opposite way. Yeah, I, I feel the opposite way because I look at both of you and I think about like all of the things over the course of your long careers, all the things that you've created and all the people that you've connected to in audiences with your performing, and and I and I, it's very inspiring. That, that an artist would be able to persevere and to continue and to grow and to change and come up with new ideas in different ways and experiment. I mean, it, to me, that's very, very inspiring. And, and the idea of saying, you know, you're, you, you know, between 64 and 68, 1864 and 1868, he was creative. That's, that's bull. I mean, I mean, it really is the long arc is to me so inspiring. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one, in, in one sense, you can take pleasure, like you were talking about uh, spending time with your grandchildren, you know, you, like we're talking about the farm, oh, then the river, then the, there's the, oh, we need two moons so we can, you know, <laughs> climb to one of them, you know, that's, that's creativity right there. And I think through that ideas do come that you might want to produce, but. Plus you're, in, you're inspiring them to have a career of falling down and, and a career of watch this, getting to that yeah. point. Yeah, that, that's so important. Yeah, and they, and they have their own logic too. So um, one has to tread carefully around that. 
because I, I got into trouble one, once with my grandson, my oldest grandson. And I said, you know, no, the, 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 planet, the planets don't do that, you know. <laughs> yes, they do. They do. They get bigger and smaller. Well, yeah, I mean, they may look that way, but they actually, they, they, they don't. They, they, yes, they do. They, <laughs> they do. Yeah, you're right, they do. You have to, you know. Wow. They're only this this child is four and a half, five, you know. <laughs> um, I guess my last question is in this these pandemic times, of course, the Zoom you know, format has become popular and people are filming their work. I I've thought about filming my work, these new things. But do you feel that there's a corner that's turned that do you feel live performance will return to its rightful place in hit or are we moving into a new era where artists well, like I, you want to film it rather than perform it you know well i think both i i, I don't want to make any predictions because it probably will not become come true but i i feel like that there's a definitely an opening of possibility rather than a closing because yes i think you know live theater is already coming back and what I have trouble with is the, is the fact that you have to do so many shows each week in order to a make a living and b cycle through the audience potential, and that uh, um, media presentation can go on and on and on. You don't you don't have to keep doing it. You've done it for good or for ill, obviously, and then people can watch it. And I think that's great. You know, I mean, people have watched my show what what will you be in england and france and uh, the east coast uh and the west coast and, uh, you know whoever whoever accesses that marsh um uh e-letter you know and, uh, or whoever we tell mm -hmm. and, and what what do you want to be when you grow up um i want to be loved by my grandchildren oh, beautiful my children. Okay, Jeff, this has been fantastic. I think there's so much here that we could have another session at some point in the future. There's, uh, we have questions that we didn't ask that we would love to ask you. And uh, you're such a wonderful artist and um, just a resource of humanity and thoughts. And uh, thanks for doing this with us. Well, you're very kind to say that. And, and you're very kind to uh, invite me. I am very... Uh, very appreciative of somebody wanting to hear what I have to say. Thank you for listening to the Mime Radio Show. Join us in two weeks for a conversation with the chameleons.